Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for today is called Northern Light. This is a story about the temporal displacement of mass. It is also a story about teleportation. Do you know what those terms mean? No, I didn't think you did, but you stay right where you are, my charming friend, and you're quite likely to find out. You just stay right there and listen. I'll tell you everything you want to know. And maybe, well, maybe a couple of things you're not terribly anxious to know. Ever see the Northern Lights? Aurora Borealis is their right name. You don't see them very often below the 50th parallel of latitude in this country, but up in northern Minnesota and Canada, upper New York, places like that, they're quite common on the winter night. If you've seen them, you know what they look like. If you haven't, there's no use by trying to describe them. Sometimes they fill a whole northern sky with waves of color, like a fire burning way beyond the horizon. Sometimes they're just long streamers of fire filling up the whole sky. And another time they look like gigantic, fringed curtains of pure light, swaying as if some cold cosmic breeze plucked at them way far off there to the north. And you can hear them, too, sometimes. Well, maybe not exactly hear them, but, but there's a sound, a humming, a, that crackling somewhere inside your head. And there are times when you'd swear it's a voice talking to you, talking in some kind of strange language you can almost understand, filling your whole being with a kind of desperate, inescapable terror. You know what I mean? At night, in the cold night, voices talking and saying things to you that you can almost understand, filling the night sky with signs and portents of, of inescapable terror. And nobody, nobody in the whole world knows what they are, nobody in this world at least, except me. And after I get done talking to you, you'll know too. And you won't be happy. Let me show you something now. This is from a recording I made on, uh, let's see, December 13th, 1948, a little more than a month and a half ago. I started the recorder while Norman and I were just about finished with our work that afternoon here in the laboratory. I just set the microphone on top of the file cabinet there and turned on the machine. Listen, I'm going to play it back for you. The quality isn't so very good, but you can recognize my voice and, and Norman's, I think. Here. Well, I got the call. Rewound now, I guess. Ready to test it? How can I test it when I say I just got to rewound? Yeah, hurry up. It's almost 6 o'clock. Yeah. Well, it's dark, but I didn't realize the time. Hurry up. I'm hurrying. Um, be a display tonight, you suppose? Well, how do I know? Been a display the last three nights. Well, that was a dinger last night, wasn't it? Yes, the machine wasn't ready. Hey, listen, now, do you think you can do better than I can? Ouch! What's the matter? Oh, I stuck my finger. Where'd you... Where'd you put the copper sulfate? Um, oh, up above the sink. Huh? Uh, I got it. What are you doing? Testing the coil. How's it? Oh, it looks okay. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, it's okay. I'll be right with you. Uh, hook it up. What are you going to send? You try my cigarette lighter. That won't work anyway. I'll, I won't miss it if we don't get it back. Now, I don't know how the thing will work when the northern lights aren't shining. Well, maybe they are shining. Turn off the room light. Let's see. All right. Pretty early, I uh... yeah. What's the matter? Hey, look. Ooh. Out early tonight. Oh, boy, that's fine. The whole sky. Look, blue and yellow. 
Yeah, I, I never saw those long fringes. Is that what they're saying? I'll say, did you turn on the recorder? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's turning over. Let's see. <clears throat> now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party. I'll leave it alone. Uh, you about ready now? Well, it's funny about the Aurora. Northern Lights? Listen to this well, part closely, friend. Oh, I don't know. Remember what I told you. You, you can almost hear the darn things. Uh, not hear them, I mean, but it's, uh, it's kind of like somebody talking to you in a language you can, you can almost understand. I don't know. I mean, did you ever notice it? Sure. High frequencies, I guess. Something. Awful lot we don't understand. Look, uh, you go there to the recorder and talk into the mic. Talk what? Well, just describe what happens for the record. I know it now, sir. I know you're not, but just say what you see so we'll have an accurate record. Okay. Now? Go ahead. <clears throat> this is an experiment in the temporal displacement of a solid object. Uh, in other words, the first actual demonstration of a time machine. If it works. It'll work all right. Go on. Paul is now placing his old beat-up cigarette lighter on the stage of the hypercube candelator, and he is now setting the microchronometer to determine how far into the future he's going to send the lighter. Well, how far, Paul? Uh, ten seconds. Ten seconds. Uh, at, at the end of that time, if our calculations are correct, and we hope they are, the cigarette lighter will reappear. In that period of time, it will have been into the future. Uh, we could send it farther into the future if we wanted to, I guess, but we'd just have to wait that much longer for time to catch up with it and make it reappear. But ten seconds, well, I mean, uh, we can prove our point by sending it ten seconds into the future just as well as ten years ahead, and this way we don't have to wait so long. Hey, how am I doing, Paul? I go into your commercial. When Paul presses the little button, the cigarette lighter will turn to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not right. It'll be here, but it'll be ten now, seconds. Listen away. closely, please. Yeah. Well, now, What's um, going to happen? Mr. Paul McGillicott, a famous mad scientist, is about to press the big old button and send his lighter into the future. You ready, Paul? Here we go. Stand by. By golly, it is gone. It just disappeared. Bang, like that. Hold your watch up close to the mic, Paul. It's over to record. Yeah. Um, the, 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 there isn't a sign of the lighter. Uh, the little stage on which Paul placed it is empty, and it should uh, appear again in, in just a second if it really did work. Three, two, one. It's back! It's back, Norm! It worked! We made it! Oh, man, let's, let's see if it's all right. Oh, oh, now what? Oh, the lighter. Oh, it's cold, Paul. Ooh, here, here, here. Take it, take it, Paul. Take it. It's freezing cold. What do you know? The darn thing's like a piece of ice. Now, where the dickens do you suppose it's been in that ten seconds? No, wait, friend. You know, That's not right. the payoff yet. Said, oh, only in the future. Listen. And time's caught up with it. It's, it's back, but... Hey, Paul, look. Where did that come from? What? There on the stage where the lighter was. Where'd that come from? In the middle of winter. where the cigarette lighter went. What are you talking about? The feel it, Paul. Feel it's fur. See? It's as cold as ice, too. A caterpillar. A little brown and black caterpillar, the kind they call woolly bears. You know, larva of the tiger moth, the I see Isabella. In the dead of winter and as cold as ice. Where did it come from? Huh? You want to know. Incidentally, you know, the old-timers say that the woolly bear caterpillar is a weather prophet. If the brown bands on his fur are narrow, there's a severe winter ahead. If they're wide, it's going to be a mild winter. Yeah, maybe. This one, you could hardly see the brown bands. Tough weather ahead, that's what the old-timers would say. But where'd she come from? She wasn't there when we put the cigarette lighter on the stage. When time caught up again, there she was. She? Sure, Isabella. I see her. Isabella. Uh, I told you, remember? Well, she was wriggling happily when she arrived from 
somewhere in the future. But as she warmed up, she seemed to go into a trance, almost a, a death-like trance. So Norman said, put her in the deep freeze. Maybe she'll come to again in the cold. So we put her in the deep freeze. And in half an hour, when we looked in at her, she was wiggling happily. At ten degrees below zero, Fred. Now, can you tie that? My goodness, she should have been frozen solid. Well, nothing special happened for a couple of days. That, you remember, was a month and a half ago, December 13th, 1948. Where were you on the night of December 18th? A Saturday night, a week before Christmas. I'd been Christmas shopping in the afternoon, I remember. I came back to the laboratory to check up on some stuff. And Norman was there, fiddling with things. Hi, Norm, I said. How's Isabella? You know something funny, Paul? What's the matter with you? Who, me? He looks so pale. You sick? Eat something disagreed with you? Paul, Isabella's singing. Singing what? Uh, Isabella's singing? <laughs> You're dotty. She's singing. The caterpillar's singing. Not tap dancing, I hope. I'm not kidding you. Oh, I cut it out. Open the deep freeze and listen. You've been at the C2H5OH? I haven't had a drink since Thursday night. Well, now, what? Open you... the deep freeze and listen. No kidding? No kidding. Well, we, we don't know where she came from. I won't be surprised at anything. Hello, Isabella. Hey, don't do that. What's the matter? Afraid she'll answer me back? Well, I don't know what. <laughs> Hello, Isabella. <laughs> I hear you singing. I told you. I don't hear anything. Now, listen, Paul. I haven't lost my buttons. I've been hearing it all afternoon. I couldn't figure out what was doing it, and then I noticed it was louder alongside the deep freeze here. So I opened it up and stuck my head inside, and it was coming from her. Yeah. Uh, what does it sound like, Norm? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, A-E-I. A-E-I? Didn't she say A-E-I-O-U and sometimes W-Y? Now, don't rid me. I tell you, I heard it. <laughs> I think you better take a Christmas vacation, Norm. I'm not, no. I know, kid, I know, but listen. We've been playing around with some pretty deep cosmic secrets, you and me. We've managed temporal displacement, which nobody in the world has ever done, see. Uh, maybe we both need a rest. You know what I think, Paul? What? I think we've managed teleportation, too. And we don't know it. Teleportation? You mean like Charles Ford talks about? I mean transporting tangible objects from one place to another without any mechanical means. Electronically? I don't know, Paul. All I know is that that cigarette lighter was someplace where it was awful cold. And it wasn't cold here in this room. Well. And where did that caterpillar come from? I don't know. It came from wherever that cigarette lighter went, Paul. But where? I don't know. Somewhere. And you know what? I'm going to find out where it came from. You are? And how, may I ask you? I'm going to modify this gadget of ours, this hypercucambulator, so it'll carry a man. And then, my dear boss, I'm going to sit down in it and have you send me out there somewhere in time and space and come back and tell you all about it. That's all for tonight, bud. What? Come on, I'll take you out and buy you a drink. I'm not fooling, Paul. Okay, okay, you're not fooling, Norm. Get your hat and coat and come on. <laughs> I prescribe hot buttered rum. Well... Turn off the lights. Will you listen to me for Turn a Turn off the lights. I want hot buttered rum. Okay, okay. Gosh, look out of that window. The northern lights. Well, they're really bright tonight. They sure are. Look how they pulse. Up, down. Up, down. Norm. Up, what? Look at the deep freeze there in the dark. What about? You see it? Light, Paul. Light. It's a... It's... I see it, Norm. It's right in step with the northern lights. And the same color. Red, red. Blue, blue. Up, down. Up, Coming down. from the deep freeze where our little friend down. Isabella was singing to you. Now, what hey, do you... Paul, listen. I don't let me...
We never did get that hot-blooded rum. We stayed there in the laboratory for a long time, listening to the voice of the thing in the box, endlessly repeating A-E-I-O-U, the vowel sounds of our speech, and watching the light that pulsed up in the deep freeze in perfect rhythm with the flickering of the northern lights we watched in the window. And we thought long, long thoughts that I, I don't remember any too clearly now. I do know we both of us thought of ways to perfect our little mechanism, our time machine. Our machine that brought back a little cold brown and black caterpillar from somewhere. And when it was morning, and the lights had faded from the northern skies, we found that our machine was very different. The stage where we found the caterpillar was larger now. I had only a vague recollection of what had happened in the night. I said to Norm, Norman, I said, what did we do last night? I don't know for sure, Paul. Could we rebuild that thing? Make it larger? I don't know. I, the thing, well, I mean, I think I dreamed I was working on it. I think I hit my finger with a hammer. I see. Hmm. Tom's all bruised. Certainly looks it. Well, nobody could have gotten in here. The door's locked. The machine's certainly different. This coil, I think. Look, it's rewound it. Did I do that? My head hurts. Mine, too. Oh, I don't get it. I don't either. I wish I could. Listen, Norm. What? Maybe we did change it. But I... Well, how could we have done all that by ourselves? I've got an idea. Why? Why, maybe Isabella helped us. A caterpillar? Oh, let's you're... see, shall we? Open the deep freeze. Well, I opened it. It was empty. There wasn't any brown and black caterpillar in the deep freeze. We took a flashlight and looked over every inch of it. We stood there and looked at each other. For a whole minute. Norman said, well, I just shook my head. We went over and sat down. All of a sudden, I said, I found her, Norman. And there she was. There was little Isabella, the caterpillar, crumpled up, stone dead on the floor of the laboratory. Now, you know, caterpillars have little tiny paws. And one of Isabella's paws was the end of a long piece of wire that ran up to the generator coil. How did she get out? And I said the thing couldn't be opened from the inside. I said it was fastened down tight when I took the lid off just now. But she did get out. Maybe. Maybe she did help us, Norm, I said. And he just sat there and stared at me. And I got up and put on my overcoat. Where are you going? Where are you going, Paul? I said I'm going to find out something on me. Where I'm going, it's cold, I said. I know that, and I'm going to find out what's been going on and where that caterpillar came from. Norm goggled at me. I stepped on the stage of the machine that was to take me away somewhere in time and space. I said, Norm, turn it on. Finally, he reached over and touched the switch. He didn't say a word. And I braced myself. I nodded at him. Go ahead, I said. And he pressed the switch. And nothing happened at all. Nothing. Why? I know, Paul, I know. It's daylight. And there aren't any northern lights. Well, it was just as well. So I had a chance to think about it a little, and I realized that just an overcoat wouldn't do me any good where I might be going. And so when it was dark night again, and the northern lights were flickering and dancing in the sky, I put on a high-altitude aviator suit that had its own source of heat supply. Norman shook his head as I got back on the stage, nodded for him to press the switch. been cold, friend. Dark? You wouldn't know how dark it can get. 
And then I was standing on an immense plain that stretched so far, so far into the distance, a plain of snow and eternal ice. A dead, cold, white world with the blackest sky above me. And the northern lights reached from horizon to horizon. Even through the high altitude suit, I could feel a biting cold. And I was afraid. Shivering, abjectly afraid. The streamers of the northern lights reached down toward me and wrapped about me. I heard the sound of voices screaming into my mind. I, I could understand them. I wished heartily I'd ever played around with cosmic forces. I yelled inside the heavy helmet. I yelled, Norman! Norman, bring me back! And there was nobody to hear me. No, I don't know where I was. Another planet. Maybe the North Pole. Maybe the lights were all around me. Maybe that's where it was. But you know, it was the most terrible, awful, cold, lonely place you could imagine in a hundred years. The lights, the flickering, living lights crawled over me and beat at me. I could almost understand what they were saying. And then the crash. The sudden blackness. I was standing again in the laboratory. I'd left only a few short seconds ago, and Norman was tearing at the fastenings of my suit and beating at me with both hands. I wondered what in the world he was doing until I got the helmet off. He was brushing caterpillars off me. Thousands of cold, freezing cold, brown and black Isabella caterpillars. I was in bed for a week or more. I don't know how long. Wherever it was I'd been, I'd nearly frozen to death in those short seconds. And at last, I was able to come back to the laboratory. I sat there that night with Norman. And outside the windows, the northern lights were brighter than they'd ever been before. Purple, green, yellow, black lights even. And there was a new rhythm tonight. A kind of code. Almost words. Thoughts. Not quite formed, and yet curiously disturbing. Norman, though, didn't seem to be as disturbed as I was. He just sat quietly and looked at me. Where did those caterpillars come from, Paul? I don't know. Where I was, that's all I know. Did you... Did they attack you, or... I don't know. They came from the lights. The lights? The northern lights. Where are they, Norman? The caterpillars? Yes. Where are they? In the deep freeze. Where Isabella was. Poor Isabella. What's the matter with you, Paul? I'm listening. Listening to what? Don't you hear them? I don't hear anything. Don't you? I don't hear anything. Well, listen. Listen, I don't hear anything. Turn on the recording machine. I want to see if we could pick up their voices. There isn't anything. Turn it on. Turn it on. I want a recording. Quick. Quick, Norman. They're talking to us. Listen, friend. I want to play you another recording. This is what came out of our tape recorder that night when I was listening to the voices. And Norman couldn't hear anything. Just listen. I still don't hear anything, Paul. Be still, listen. I tell you, I... Listen. What's that? Look at the deep freeze. The top's coming open. Look at the light around it, Paul. Be quiet. Watch. How did they... Good Lord, look. The caterpillars are coming out, Paul. Look at them. There's millions of them. Be still, Norman. But, but, but Paul, you... Your voice. Be still, I said. What's the matter with your voice? We want to talk to you. You what? You you said we. Why, of course, Norman. We. Who for the... It is Paul's voice, Norman. Paul's voice. Voice. But it is not Paul speaking. Listen. We speak to you. Paul. Not Paul. We, the people of the lights, we from the cold, we are speaking to you with Paul's voice. I tell you that... Paul's voice will tell you what to do when the time comes, Norman. We go to the machine now. Paul's mind is ours for a little time now. 
We go to the machine, the machine that brought us to your world from the world of the lights. Who are you? Who the people of the lights to take over this world of yours. Only this world of yours is so hot, we must have the cold world. And we know how to make it cold. What's the matter, Paul? Paul! So, so hot. No, no. Quick, Norman, turn on the machine. Send us to places in your world. No, our world. Hurry. So hot. Hurry. So hot. Paul, hurry. Hurry. Turn on the machine. <laughs> That's the end of the recording. No, I don't know. I don't have any recollection of it at all. But the recording's there, isn't it? That must be what happened. Anyway, when I woke up, Norman was gone, and there were no caterpillars in the place here. Then our machine, our machine that took people and things away into time and space, was wrecked. I don't know what became of it. You heard what they said about my voice. They're going to take over this world and make it a cold world, like the one they came from. Wherever that is, and wherever they went. No, I don't know where they went, where the machine sent them. I do have ideas. Yes. Are you cold? It's freezing in here. And just for example, uh, you read the papers? Look at the newsreels. Did you see the pictures of the snow in Los Angeles? In subtropical Los Angeles, where it hasn't snowed for so many, many years? I wondered about it, too. I wonder if anybody saw any brown and black woolly bear caterpillars in Los Angeles. Love of the tiger moth I see, Isabella. The title of today's Quiet Please story is Northern Lights. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And my laboratory assistant, Norman, was played by Dan Sutter. The voices of Isabella and her friends was that of Cecil Roy. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Now for a word about next week. Our writer, director, my good friend, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet, Please. For next week, I have a story for you that comes from the steel mills out South Chicago way. It's called Cat the Heat, Bogdan. <laughs> and so, until next week at this same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Now, a listening reminder. How are your predictions of things to come? What's your batting average? Compare your average with the man who has made predicting his business. Listen to Drew Pearson tonight on ABC.